Hello, my name is Susan Steele. I am a member of the Society of Scribes based in New York City and would like to welcome our members to our first virtual holiday fair. My co-chair Eva Kokoris and I have organized many holiday fairs over the years at the beautiful Brotherhood Synagogue in Gramercy Park, New York. But this year is unlike any other, and thanks to an enthusiastic and talented group of members, our 2020 Holiday Fair is going online. This option allows us to stay safe during COVID and still have fun while we expand our reach to a global calligraphy community. Let's take care of a little business first. The event details of the Holiday Fair can be found at societyofscribes.org slash Holiday Fair 2020. There you will find the demonstration schedule, chat times for questions and answers from instructors, and supply notes for you to create your own projects. We will also feature pop-up deals from vendors highlighting calligraphy and related products with special sale prices. And lastly, there will be quick tip videos from some of our members for helpful studio hints. The Society of Scribes recently lost an icon in the calligraphy world on October 6th. Please refer to our website at societyofscribes.org to read about the many accomplishments of Alice, a true New York original and founding member of our organization. Well, I think that brings us to the point where I say, let's get on with the show. Enjoy and please submit any comments to Eva or myself at Holiday Fair at societyofscribes.org. Thank you. Hello everyone, and thank you for joining our holiday celebration today. I'm Deborah, and uh, today I'm going to show you how to do a simple holiday project that combines an old fashioned paper craft with handwriting and calligraphy. Um, so if you can cut with scissors and if you can fold paper, this project will be very easy for you to do. You can simplify it further for younger people, or you can increase the challenge uh, if you are up for that. Um, so, but I'm gonna show you something that pretty much anyone over the age of nine should be able to do. Um, so at this time of year, no matter what um, holiday you celebrate, uh, but at this time of year in the Northern Hemisphere, we have a lot of snow often, and you often see paper, cut paper, snowflakes hanging on windows around the towns and in the schools. So I thought this would be fun to do and I'm gonna add a twist. Like I said, we're gonna add text um, using handwriting or calligraphy if you'd like. And um, even though you've done this before, this will add a whole new element of visual texture to these snowflakes. So they're a lot of fun. And before we get started, I wanna make sure you have the, the materials you need. You're going to need um, several pieces of eight and a half by 11 paper. It can be any color. I'm gonna demonstrate with white, I believe. So, you know, you can get a sense of, you know, how it works without thinking about the color. Um, you'll need a pair of scissors, preferably sharp ones. Um, you might wanna work with smaller ones because we will we'll be working fairly small. Um, you can also cut small things with large scissors, and I'm going to give you some tips on how to cut properly because there is a proper way to do it. And I didn't learn this until I went back to school for graphic design. Um, oh yeah, all those years I was doing the wrong thing with scissors. 
And um, you also need pencils uh, or markers or, or pens or even crayons, anything that you can write with that will have color and pizzazz. You might want to try metallic uh, markers, um, gel pens, things like that. And last but not least, you'll need string if you want to hang these snowflakes or you might want to glue them onto a uh, colored card stock or contrasting color stock to hang in a frame or to give this cards. So quick teaser here, I've been playing around with these for quite a while here <laughs> this past couple weeks. And here are some that I've made. Now, they're, they're pretty simple, but they're so much fun. And if you can see, I've added some writing that part of it does get cut out, but it does get visual texture to these. And I think especially kids will like these. So in just a few minutes, I'm gonna come back and we're going to get started. So gather your materials and here we go. Okay, so let's make some textured cut paper snowflakes. You start off with an eight and a half by 11 inch rectangular piece of paper. We need to get that down to an eight and a half inch square size. And you can do that by either cutting off the excess with a paper cutter, or you can measure it with a ruler, mark it off at eight and a half inches, and I would do two marks, one at opposite sides of the paper, line it out and cut it off. If you don't have a, these tools, you can do it very carefully uh, without any either of them. So take a corner from the short side of the paper and bring it up to align with the long edge. Once you have the edges pretty well lined up, give it a good crease. I'm going over with my thumb, you can use your scissors, ruler, whatever. Now, you're going to turn this paper towards you and take a pencil. I'm going to use a marker. You're just going to mark off where this edge meets the paper and then you're going to cut it. I recommend opening it to cut it so you don't cut through this piece here. And you can see there's a square that measures eight and a half by eight and a half inches. All right, once you have the square, you need to add some text. This can be a quote, a poem, a word that's repeated over and over again, or even personal thoughts. Um, let me show you some examples and we'll talk about what we're gonna, how we're gonna use this text. It's, it's going to add visual texture to the finished piece. So you can use a variety of tools. Um, you can draw letters like here. These were hand drawn with a metallic bullet uh, tip marker. Um, notice how I fill the entire page. The more you write, the, the more area you cover with the writing or the lettering, the more texture you'll get in your finished snowflake. Here, this was done with a calligraphy marker, which is a bit different than a bulletproof. It has a broad edge. And notice how I stack these letters one on top of the other to give lots of texture. Uh, you can do the whole thing, but mostly, uh, you can, I mean, you can write all the way up to the edges, but mostly the center is what we're concerned about. So as long as you have some good texture uh, for most of the space, you're going to be fine. And last but not least, you can use your everyday handwriting. And for this, I just wrote out lyrics to um, a song dashing through the snow, and I used the Crayola markers in two colors just to mix it up a bit. All right, we're going to work with this piece. So there's my square. And the next thing we're going to do is we are going to um, fold this paper so that we can uh, prepare it for cutting. Okay, um, you're going to turn it so it looks like a diamond and you're going to pull the bottom corner up to the top and fold it just like you fold it for the cutting. So from a square you go to a triangle. So take now this bottom corner if you're right-handed, if you're left-handed, take the opposite corner and you're going to fold it in half horizontally and give it a good crease. All right. 
Now this is an easy fold. Um, as you get better at this, you may want to challenge yourself. I will give you some resources for follow-up after we're done with this. All right, so the next step is to uh, draw a design on this so that you can cut it out and have this textured paper snowflake. Notice that the text that we wrote is inside the folds. Um, once this is cut away, you won't see all of this text. You'll see bits and pieces of it. And it's kind of like having a secret message that only you can, you know, you're the only one who knows what this is. So it's uh, interesting. You can write out all your thoughts and no one will ever know. Okay, so get back to this folded piece here. Set it up like this so that you can see that you have the long edge here and you have the shorter edges of the triangle here. Now I'm going to use my marker. You can use a pencil. I'll show you a couple of different patterns, but if you wanna find patterns, the best place to look is on the internet. In fact, before we draw our patterns, I wanna show you as inspiration. I have some places where you can search and um, I'm gonna show you these right now on my iPad. This first one is, I just did a Google search and came up with this. It's called Getting Up Close with Snowflakes. And within this article, um, you have, whoops, there are, they show actual snowflakes and what the patterns look like. They're so pretty and so different. As you know, each one is different than the others. And here's under magnification. So let me tilt that so it's not glaring. You can see these beautiful patterns that can inspire you. And you can take these. In fact, the one that we're going to do right now um, looks, oh, it doesn't look like any of these. There's one we're gonna do that looks a little bit like this in just a moment. But that's one place you can look. You can just do a Google search under snowflakes and images, and you'll get a bunch of different snowflakes. There's also um, a book called The Art of the Snowflake, a photographic album. And at the end, I'll, I'll have these up for you so you can copy the notes uh, of where to search. And there's also this wonderful book that I picked up. I love collecting children's books. Um, this one is called Zoo Flakes by Will C. Howell. And look at all of these beautiful snowflakes he created out of the shapes of animals. And um, this is very interesting. And also, I think, gives you a sense of what you can do with this. Now, there's no lettering in this. It's all images, but still, wouldn't it be fun to make this? I think so. All right, again, I'll have this uh, list up here at the end of the demonstration. Okay, so where were we? All right, yes, we're going to add our pattern right now. I'm going to do a pretty geometric one. But I'm gonna do some internal cutting too. And that's a little tricky, but I'll show you how to deal with that. This corner here is going to be the center of the snowflake. So it's nice to have some little cutouts in there to give it more interest. All right, so once you have your um, drawn design, then what you have to do is you have to um, mark the areas that you're going to cut out, just so you don't make a mistake. So I'm just gonna put an X, a big X that you can see in the areas that will be cut out. This area here will be cut out, as will this. Now I'm using a large pair of scissors. You may want to work smaller, but you always want to work with the back of the scissors. Um, with your opposite hand from your cutting hand, you want to really hold this paper down and try to keep your fingers away from the blades as they cut through. So I'm going to start with the outside edges of this pattern. And when I get to a joint where I have to turn, change direction, I'm not going to turn my scissors. I'm going to turn the paper with my opposite hand and continue cutting. Notice I never fully close the scissors. I open them and I close them partially. Now here I'm at the edge, so I am gonna cut off and I'll lift the scissors. All right, so I've got all these done. Now how do I cut this out? Well, these are pretty symmetrical. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna fold the paper gently right at that little V in the design and I'm going to I'm not creasing it fully I'm just going to come in like this 
and the paper. So I'm cutting out both of those small triangles at the same time. Paper's a little thicker here, so be patient. Okay. Now, we've cut out our design, and the next thing you want to do is you want to open it carefully because this one, this one's pretty good. It doesn't have a lot of small parts, but still be gentle. It is just paper. Let's see what we've got. Ta-da! Now that, that was a pretty easy one to do. Um, so let's try something a little bit more difficult, uh, even though it will be the same fold. Okay, I already have my paper folded, but let me just review. Turn your square to a diamond shape, move it up to a triangle. And here, what we're going to do is we're going to um, make another fold by taking this corner down to meet this corner. Make sure you hold these edges together with this finger down here. And we're doing that because that crease is going to, and we're going to reopen this, that crease is right here. I don't know if you can see it. Yeah, right there. And I'm going to draw into that so you can see it. That's going to help guide one of the branches that we have to fully draw out on this because it's not folded. You have to imagine this is the center line, okay? So when you draw out this half, you have to mirror this so that these, these two arms will look similar. It's not gonna be perfect, but it'll be close. And hopefully you will get excited when you do this because I, I find it very fun and I'm a grown up. And there you have it. Okay, so what do, do with these things after you're done? Well, first of all, they kind of flop up. So I suggest with a warm iron and a dry towel, you place the towel over top and then you press down and evenly, very slowly go over this so that it gets flattened. Once it's flattened, you can do a couple of things with it. So you can mount these on colored paper, contrasting paper, and you can uh, photocopy them, turn them into cards, or you can frame them and hang them, give them as gifts. I love that. Um, the other thing you can do is you can attach you know, some string and you can dangle them from trees. And let's see if I can or you know your, your christmas tree or from an archway you can turn them into a banner a string of all these different snowflakes i think would be so cool i think that's what i'm going to do with mine i have a lot of them i think at christmas time and i think that if you're interested in, in these these are so simple but you can go as i said onto the internet and here are some of the the places that you can can look the searches uh, getting up close with snowflakes uh, under all all search under image search you can just put in snowflakes or these this title I mentioned to you here's that book that I showed you with the animal or zoo snowflakes and on YouTube um, there's this one paper snowflake demo that I suggest if you want to go to the next level after trying this basic fold it gives you um, a more detailed fold and I think if you watch it and slow, stop it here and there, you can pick that up too. So I want to thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I hope you'll make some of these and maybe post them to the Instagram account um, of the Society of Scribes. And thank you so much. It's been a lot of fun. Happy holidays, everyone.
Hi everyone, it's Anna from The Ink Pad here um, in Chelsea. We moved in on February 29th. We're open for two weeks, closed a couple months, and then now we're back, better than ever. So it's definitely the holiday season. We have lots of people coming in to buy rubber stamps, pens. Um, we're so happy to be part of the Society of Scribes event. They always um, put on such a wonderful show and I'm sorry we can't all be together in person this year. But let me show you how to do some heat embossing. It's one of the ways that I actually started the business over 22 years ago. So let me just show you here. Um, so one of the things we sell is these beautiful like white cards and envelopes. Um, and what they are is super, super smooth paper so that you can stamp on them and um, that full image comes out. So this is a Versamark ink pad. It is a um, embossing pad that, what stamp do I wanna use? It's always so fun choosing. It's an embossing pad that stays wet long enough for you to put the powder on. So this, you ink up your stamp. Thank you, Jane, for doing the filming today. So I'm gonna ink up this stamp. I have to turn it towards me. I can't stamp upside down. But I'm gonna do a little design that's gonna bounce around. And what's so interesting about the Versafine is you actually, as you can see by my blank paper, you cannot see where you're quite stamping your work. Normally I would have my glasses on and also stamp, so this is fun. This is kind of like blind stamping here. So then you always wanna cover your ink pad because the powder will get on the ink pad, which you don't want. Then you take this, I have plain paper here, and then under it I have a silicone mat. And always the phone will ring and I'm not going to grab it because it's too far for me, sorry about that. Who's ever calling, will I will call them back. So you put the powder on, kind of shake it around a little. And let's see what we ended up with here. Tap it on your paper when I did a crazy, a crazy looking stamping, but so far that's how it looks, okay? Then what I'm gonna do is make sure to put the, oops, powder, oops, 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 back into my little jar here. Tap it all in. Invariably, whenever you're using powder, glitter, etc., it ends up on you. <sighs> Embossing powder. Trials and tribulations. What you next need to do, so this is step three. So first step is to use the Versamark pad. Second step is to use your powder. We like WOW embossing powder, it's really nice. Then this is a heat gun, I'm gonna turn it on. Heat guns, they heat to 600 degrees within just that quick amount of time. Then you're gonna hold it over and it embosses, embosses. So this color is called Unicorn Magic. It's a very pretty, snowflakey color. It's not at quite as showy as something else, but I'm gonna stamp one other thing here. I'm gonna do it also in silver. So let me just do a little quick finny. So we'll have an all over snowflake design. Snowflake, snowflake. I like to go off the page sometimes. It's kind of fun because you can, uh, it looks more authentic and you don't have to get it in a certain spot. I love doing these all over random designs. So I know I did it there. I may have done it there. Let's see, let's see. Thank you guys for sticking with us and watching and being part of this fun Sunday. All right, so that's my powder. And then turn your heat gun on. Let your heat gun get, this time the heat gun's hotter the second time I'm using it. So be careful. Do you see how that changes? See how that changes? Changes. And there you go. And like magic, you've got a quick little card. Not my best work. Don't tell people this is all I do, but it's really fun. So that's heat embossing. We've got all the supplies here. Everything that we've got here is available on our uh, website, which is theinkpadnyc.com. And the wood stamps, which are right in front here, are one of the only things we don't sell um, through the website because we get them in so often, they go in and out the door so quickly. But we could always take a special order. So you could email me 
um, which is info at theinkpadnyc.com. We'd be happy to help. You're also welcome to always give a call. I work here usually Monday to Friday and sometimes on the weekends too, depending what we need. But we hope to see you soon. And if there's anything we can help you with, let us know. Thanks. Hi, this is Eleanor Winters talking to you from Brooklyn, New York, and I'm happy to be part of the Society of Scribes Holiday Fair, which unfortunately is remote, but we're going to do the best we can and try to make this fun for everybody. So I'm going to demonstrate for you a little technique that I've been developing over the last year or two and have done quite a lot of uh, artwork with over this past few months of the pandemic. I've been finding that um, making these alphabets that I've been working on out of bright colors is, um, cheer it cheers me up. It's a, it's a nice way to use my calligraphy, to use color, to work with paint, and to make something that feels good. So what I'm going to do is switch over to a document camera. And first, I'll show you a couple of the finished pieces. So you see what I'm talking about. And then I'll show you the materials that I use. And following that, I will make uh, an example to show you how to do it. Um, you may not learn how to do this in one quick session, but you might find this um, entertaining. So first thing I'm going to do is switch my camera. And we're now on a document camera. And I'm going to be talking uh, facing uh, my desk here. And first, I just want to show you what I'm talking about. These are small, uh, six by nine, five by seven, some bigger, some eight by 10 pieces that have layers of color on them. Um, an under layer of oil pastel and a top layer of oil paint. There's no ink on this. The alphabet is done with a pen on top of these paints. I'm going to just go through a few quickly. These are all done sort of freehand, meaning of course no lines. I can't draw lines on oil paint. And I am using some broad edge nibs. So sometimes I do a sequential alphabet. Uh, this one, for example, I did backwards. Um, Z, 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 and then Y, X, etc., down to A. And the color underneath is actually kind of shiny um, because it's a um, kind of a, a, a silver based blue that is under this top layer. Um, this one is a little more um, typically sequential, A, B, C, D, going to Z, but I varied a little bit in the size and the form of the letters I did. So I have uh, an italic capital, I have gothicized italic, I'll point with this, gothicized italic minuscules, and then suddenly a couple more big capitals here, and a big, a big V and a big Z. One more just to show you a little color range. Um, I like using blue as a background because it, it pops out very well. This one I'm doing with some yellows and red over a white um, uh, background. I'll show you how to do that in a moment. And just to show you one or two more, here's a, a very tight alphabet. This is fairly small. It's about, oh, four inches by nine inches. But using a big pen on a small paper is always um, very appealing to me. It sort of pushes the boundaries of the, the space. So I could show you about um, two or 300 more, but I won't. 
instead that's what I've done over the last few, few months. So instead I'm going to show you what I'm using. And these are oil pastels. Um, oil pastels are uh, creamy, brightly colored. Let's take out a couple more. Um, brightly colored, uh, they're sort of like crayons, but much, much smoother and richer. This brand is called Sennelier. And these are fairly big sticks, as you can see. I have um, a big box full like that. You can see they've been used quite a bit. So um, I've been working with these for a while. It gets kind of messy, as you can guess. Uh, therefore, I have a lot of paper towels around. I have to keep washing my hands and wiping them. I always, I wipe them on paper towels just to get the residual paint off, and then I have to get up and wash them often. I'm working on watercolor paper. Here's a, a piece of watercolor paper. I'll show you. This is one pad, uh, Canson XL, kind of inexpensive, which is nice for watercolor, uh, which tends to be quite costly, but you need something fairly heavy. This is 140 pound or 300 gram. You don't want to do this on a thin paper because it'll just wrinkle the paper. You need something substantial. This paper I have, um, you can see I, I cut it in half and it has one side is a little bit rougher and one side is smoother. I like the smoother side, but you can do what you like. Uh, this is this is not, there aren't any rules for this. You can make things up as you go along, try it out and see what you can do. Um, so I cut some paper, these different sizes. I have some horizontals. I have, um, I guess I'm gonna keep, I'm going to keep this underneath so you can see against a dark background. There's the paper. So this is a, um, a six by nine, I think. Uh, these are longer and narrower. And um, occasionally I'll use a full sheet that's nine by 12, but not a whole lot bigger. So what do I do? Um, other materials I meant to mention, I use browse nibs. So you're familiar with these broad edge nibs. I like browse nibs because they're kind of stiff and you can put a lot of pressure on them and they don't uh, separate. They can, they can uh, cut the letters out of the color. That's exactly what I'm doing. I also need to use um, this uh, interesting um, medium. This is a medium for oil paint, meaning it is a kind of a gooey substance called liquine. And what I do, what you use it for in oil painting is it, he it helps it dry faster. I use it on oil pastels or with oil pastels, I'm about to do that, uh, because otherwise the oil pastels don't dry. I have this experience with, um, I'm coming back just to tell you about this very quickly. Uh, here I am again. <laughs> um, I made a number of pieces uh, using just oil pastel without the Lequeen and the, the color didn't dry. And when anything touched it, it came off. So I made a lot of work that got ruined. So I learned about Lequeen. And what I do is as follows. I'm going to demonstrate the technique. So back to my document camera. I have some Lequeen in a little container here. I squeeze it out of the big bottle. And here it is. It's a very unappealing looking jelly-like substance. And what I will be doing is spreading some of this on my paper with a palette knife. This is used for painting, oil painting. It's all, it's kind of old looking, but it works just fine. And I am going to put a little bit on the surface. This is now, this is how we do it. I'm, I'm just tapping some on, I'm not smearing it too much. And I am going to take um, some, some uh, color, here's a purple, and I'm just gonna scribble over it like that. And I'm putting it right over the Lequeen because it mixes the Lequeen in with the color. Okay, now I've put some purple on here. 
Uh, I'm going to take my paint and put my oil stick and put it aside and take um, a blue. Here's a nice, nice bright blue. I'm going to add some little bits of this La Queen. I'm spreading it a little bit, kind of casual. You know, I'm not worrying too much. If there's a little bit too much, I can spread it like that. And I'm gonna color in here, add some blue to this. So I'm trying to make a, a, a two color background that's going to end up actually as a three color background because the colors will blend a little bit. The next thing I do, I'm going to do with my hands. I'm gonna take my finger and rub over the paint. I'm going to spread it around like that. And I'm working on the lighter color first because the darker color is gonna get on my hand and mix in a little bit with my lighter color. I'm adding a little more of the blue. It's looking a little thin. And get that a little more smeared. And once I get the blue a little bit spread a little bit, so it's not uneven, I'm going to blend it into the purple like that and like that. So I have some parts here that are sort of blue purple and then I'll hit the purple here. So fairly quickly, I create a background and that background is my lower la layer, my first layer. Something like that, okay? Um, I'm going to take my paper towel and wipe my hands. Um, this comes off pretty well. Um, and I'm going to reach a couple of these that I prepared before. These are also backgrounds. I'm going to take this one away. Um, where I also added a border color. This one I did obviously in a cadmium yellow and a bright green. And here's another blue purple one. And I added on top of it, this color, let me find it here. This is a kind of a shiny white. I'm not sure what it's called, but it's a white that has a little mica in it or some kind of um, sparkly stuff. So it's, these are very good quality pastels. I'm going to mention that. I've tried this with uh, cheaper ones. They're, they're a bit expensive. I've tried it with cheaper ones. The color isn't as rich and the quality isn't as good. This is one, now the, the piece that I just did, that background I just did is now, I'm reaching it here. This is what I just did. It's still wet. If I go like that, it's going to come off on my hand. I have to leave this overnight uh, or preferably for two days. So I'm not going to work on this one, but I'm going to use this one that I prepared um, a couple of days ago so that I could show you on, this is dry. And the reason it's dry is thanks to this Liquine that I can put aside now. So here is the piece, the the um, the lower level. This is a two level background that we're going to do. Now, what am I going to do next? I am going to take some oil paint and cover this. And what I will do is, let me just reach it here. Um, I'm going to use some white oil paint. Um, I'm just gonna squeeze some on here. See, this is very um, kind of forgiving, this kind, of, this kind of thing. And I'm gonna use my finger again. I'm gonna spread it around because what I want to do is put another color on top of this. I'm gonna bring it almost to the edge. Again, I'm using my fingers. This is a real tactile kind of technique. Okay. I'm spreading it fairly thin. Um, I'm bringing it to the border. So I'm covering the blue. I'm leaving a little bit showing. Where's my white? I need more white. Let's get a bit more white on here. A bit more, a bit more. 
see I'm getting a bit messy with the paint here, but I'm trying to keep the edges clean. And I'm going to talk about that in a moment, how we keep our edges clean. And, but let's get this white done. So I'm making another layer on top of that blue. And because I allowed the blue to dry, um, this is sitting on top of it as opposed to um, bleeding into it. This won't bleed. Okay, I'm going to wipe my hands again with my paper towel. I have a big roll of paper towels right next to me. And then I don't want a white background. I want a light blue background. So I have here two tubes of um, oil paint, two different brands, uh, Winsor Newton and a Grumbucker, whatever I have around. I like Winsor Newton better. It's a little bit nicer quality, but I grabbed this uh, right now. I'm going to take a little bit of Prussian blue. And when I say a little bit, I am going to uh, put some on the side. You can't see this, but I'm just smear putting a little bit on the outside of my palette up here. And I'm going to tap a little bit onto my finger and just, uh, just rub that in. See, now look how beautiful that is. The This, this blue, this Prussian isn't that nice? It, <laughs> it creates um, a lot of color with a tiny drop of paint. I'm going to take a bit more, tiny bit more, and put it here. I'm just baking this up as I go along. This is There's so much trial and error involved in this. A lot of error, as well as some trial. I'll close my paint. And actually, instead of um, using another blue, I'm going to take a, a little of this magenta. Again, just a little bit, and I'm putting it, I'm just squeezing it onto a piece of paper on the side here, little, little bit of paint, put it here, okay? See, I'm getting a little, a little streak of purple in, in there. So this is a bit random. I just want to be sure that my, um, my paint isn't too thick. Not too thin, not too thick. Try it and see what works. Okay, if I rub it too much, the two colors are going to create yet a third color. So this is my background for this one sample I'm going to make for you. And just closing my paint here. It's always good to close it. Wipe my hand again. And now I'm going to show you a little, a little trick. I'm going to move this up just a little. I'm just changing my camera so that you can see the whole paper. Higher. Okay. Well, yeah, you can see most of it. I am going to do this. I have cut some strips of white paper like this, just regular bond paper, and I'm going to mask off the edges. I'm going to put this on the edge with a bit of tape. This is um, a removable tape. This is white artist tape, which is removable, so it won't tear the paper. I'm going to tape it here and tape it here at the bottom. I'm taping it here. I'm going to put another one along the bottom edge like that. So why am I doing this? I'm doing this because working with this color, it tends to get on your fingers, even when you're quite careful. And I prefer not to get fingerprints around the edge of my piece. It doesn't come off, you know, there's no way to clean it off. So I like the edges to remain clean as you can See, so I now I've now masked this left, right, and bottom, and then I'm taking this this piece of wood that has um, that's built up so that it becomes sort of a bridge that I can put over the 
page so that I don't write with my hand directly on it. Because if I my hand is on the paint, it's just going to smear it and it's all going to um, come off. So I'm going to take this and remove my background because I need space for my, my bridge. Now, you see what it has? I don't know how well you can see this. Let me turn one more time to the other camera. This is what it looks like. It's, it's just a piece of thin wood, thin wood that has little, um, little strips of wood at each end to make um, a little surface that will sit above the paper. And that way this won't be on the paper and the left side and the right side of this bridge will protect the paper from my hand and my hand from the paper. So let me go back uh, here and I'm going to put it in place. And I am going to take my browse nib and I'm going to uh, suggest that you limit yourself to the larger sizes. You can do this with small ones. Uh, my preference is the three millimeter, four millimeter and five millimeter because it's you get a, a bolder and stronger letter. And sometimes you, if you use a fine nib, which I, I have tried, you can lose the detail. So you can't really see what you're doing. Okay, so when I do this, I'm gonna move this down. I'm gonna make an alphabet here and I'm going to have my paper towel in my left hand because every time I do this I have to wipe the pen off because what I'm doing watch this what I'm doing is I'm picking the paint scraping the paint off the paper so I'm cutting through one layer of color I'm cutting through the the oil paint and revealing the oil pastel. So here's an A. And I'm doing this after every couple of strokes, I'm wiping off my nib, A. I'm going to do three A's at the top. Are they going to bump into each other? Yes. Does it matter? Not really. Just straighten that a bit. Okay. Now, let's do another little swash here. Okay, now here's something I'm going to show you. I don't like that A. So what am I going to do? I'm going to I'm going to take it out. I'm not happy with that A. I just took it off with my finger. Let's return that. And I'm going to make another A here that I think I like better. Okay, isn't that nice? You can you can change it just by wiping it off with your finger. Now, I'm going to I'm going to do a little bit more um, I'm going to change nibs. I'm looking at my paper and I think that whole alphabet is going to have a problem fitting on this page. So I just started with my five millimeter nib. I am switching to a four. The four is a little smaller and it will enable me to fit my alphabet in a little bit better. So here's my B. I'm going to do a different kind of, oops, my pen, my pen just skidded. So I'm wiping it off. Do it again. Now notice my hand is on this edge here to keep it stable. And I'm pressing pretty hard. Here's a C. A D. I'm doing this uh, kind of at random, not only in terms of position, but letter forms. So a couple of different alphabets. Let's just add an E here. 
And I'm going to try to keep this balanced left to right. So I'll put in an F over here and let it curve over to the side like that. I'm doing this slowly. I'm moving my pen slowly and trying to stay with pretty calligraphically accurate letter forms. So to the best of my eye, I am making these the right X height. I don't want to do um, completely random forms in terms of the relationship between the width of the pen and the height of the letter. So these A's are taller than the B, the E, but this is a five millimeter nib and this is a four. So here's an I. I keep wiping this. Let's put our J in here. Okay. Okay, I think you're getting the idea of how I do this. Um, shall I complete this? I think I've been talking much longer than I was uh, asked to speak. So I think I'll leave it. Um, I think you have seen some of the other examples that, um, that I showed you. I'm, I'm going to switch back to... Uh, my face. So here's here's the beginning of an alphabet. And um, if I did this, if my background was more multicolored, um, like this one, for example, this one I used green and white. So my background varies a little more, which means my letter forms vary in color. On this piece, I did a backwards alphabet and then the same thing upside down. So that here it is from A, A, B, C, D, E, F, and then upside down. So I turned it over. So I never wrote upside down, but I just wrote in one direction and then wrote in the other direction. Um, let me just come back for a minute because I want to say goodbye. <laughs> so um, just to, to uh, wrap this up, this is something that you can spend um, quite a lot of time uh, experimenting with. I have tried oil pastel on top of oil pastel, which is more difficult because of the drying. I've tried uh, oil paint on top of oil paint, and um, I can show you one that didn't work. I have loads of rejects. This is oil, pa oil paint on top of oil painted. It's a bit of a mess. I couldn't get the color to work well, the under color. The under color was quite bright. I, I had a, a bright lavender and a cobalt blue under these tones. Not so good. So oil on oil is not as good as oil on oil pastel. Uh, I tried oil paint on top of acrylic, a little dull. So um, when I said earlier, I'm developing this I'm continuing to do so. And I think I've done maybe 400 of these and I probably have 40 that I like. <laughs> I like them as I make them and then I look at them later and I think, oh, you know, this could be better. So I offer you this to, to try out on your, on your own and um, I hope you enjoyed watching. So I'll say goodbye and I'll see you at next year's holiday fair maybe. Bye.
Judy Caston here with a few of my favorite tools from Paper and Ink Arts. The first is a chunky pen holder that's very comfortable. It's less than five and a half inches long and uh, in it is a Nico G nib. Then to go with that is the Moon Palace Sumi. Uh, my favorite brush pens are the Pentel color brushes and you may be familiar with those, but what I like to do when I have one that's dry is to make a, a mark with it and then use either other colors of the Pentel color brushes or some colored pencils or markers, highlighters, or anything you like and fill in those spaces so that you get a nice ribbon. Have fun. Hi, I'm Cynthia, Cynthia Danzig, and I'm about to do an interesting demonstration of something which is not calligraphy. It's writing, but it's not calligraphy. And it's a very unusual system of writing, which I'm going to show you right now, because when we have the annual holiday fair at the temple, which we are not doing this year, I usually have a sign up on my table, and here's the sign, and I wonder if you can read it. And right now, here's the sign. Can you read that sign? It says B-R-A-I-L-L-E, Braille, B-Y, by, capital, C-Y-N-T-H-I-A. It says Braille by Cynthia. And you might wonder about um, that particular system. And it's very interesting, but I have to give you a little background story first. So I'm gonna move this away and I'm gonna put a woodcut that I did long ago at Bard College of my very best friend, and her name was Emerald Rose McKenzie. And at Bard College, you got 50 cents an hour if you would read to the blind. And so I thought I could use 50 cents an hour, and I met Emerald Rose McKenzie, who, by the way, became my best friend, maid of honor at my wedding, and the wonderful subject of many woodcuts, which I did. But the thing about Emerald is that she was completely blind, and so I learned from her how she did her writing. And it was a very interesting system. And here's the way that it worked. It worked with a series of dots. And this is, I'm just going to enlarge this to make it as clear as possible for you. But it's a system of six spots. Spot one, spot two, spot three, and then spot four, spot five, and spot six. And all Braille is done by activating certain of these dots in a certain sequence. And so the entire alphabet is this. And if you look at this right here, this is the entire alphabet in Braille. When you activate dot one, just alone, it's the letter A. You'll be able to learn this so easily, it's extremely simple. A B is dot one and two, one and two. And a C is dot one, one, two, three, four, one and four. A D is dot one, two, three, four, five, one, four, five. And an E is dot one, one, two, three, four, five, just one and five. And F is one, two, and four. And a G is the top four, one, two, three, four. Four, five. An H is one, two, three, four, five. And an I is two and four. And a J is two, three, four, five. Now, those are very easy. And when you see them, it's quite easy for us because we can see. But for a blind person, how would you be able to read them? Well, they have developed a wonderful system. It is a, a kind of, I think it's called 
a slate. It's a braille slate. And if you look at this braille slate, you'll see that it has the tiny little system, one, two, three, four, five, six. And if you open the braille slate, and then if you put a card inside of it and snap it down, hold on a moment. Did you hear that? You take a little stylus and you push down on the stylus and it makes a little dot, a little hole. And then if you take it out, you can actually see, I don't know if you can see the dot that you can feel on the other side. And so to make the alphabet in Braille, all you have to do is press down and the dot will appear on the other side of the paper. But just like a woodcut, if you press it down here, if you press dot one down here, when you turn it over, when you turn it over so you can feel it, it's going to appear in spot number four. So the idea is that you have to write, if you write the braille with a stylus and the slate, you have to do it backwards. And that's quite difficult to learn, but it can be done. Another thing that they've developed, and this is something that if you get interested in the actual braille and you want to do it other than the visual way that we're going to do right now, but if you want to do the actual punch through dot braille, you can get one of these little slates which you put a three by five index card in, and then you turn it over and you can do the other side of the card because this alternates with the uh, silent, with the black empty spot here, it alternates. So you do the same pushing through backwards, but uh, if you're interested, you can find me later and I can show you where to obtain these interesting items. But the thing that I want to show you now is how amazing the Braille alphabet is. We've gone over the first one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, the first 10 letters. And you'll notice that they only use the top four spots, one, two, four, five. Now, the reason that it's so wonderful is that the second 10 letters are exactly the same with the addition of dot number three. So that a K is the same as an A, but it adds dot number three. And then an L is the same as the B, but it adds dot number three. So when you go right through from K to T, you see it's exactly the same as the first 10, but with the addition of dot number three. It's so logical, it's so lovely. Now, the last few letters add an additional dot, dot number six. So you have the same A and the same K, but you add dot number six and there's your U. And B plus an L and add the number, the dot number six, and you have a V. Now, what happens to this W? It's not what it should be. It should be this. It should be the, what the X is. The reason is that Louis Braille, who developed this system in France, there was no W in the French alphabet. So he just went from V to X. But for most of the um, Romance languages, and certainly English, we have to have the W. And so that was developed later. And what they simply did, they took the R, which is one, two, three, five, and flipped it over, and that's the W. And then X, Y, and Z follow the system of adding dot number three and dot number six. So it's quite easy to learn. And one of the things that I like particularly is that Braille is not only for the, for the blind and the unsighted, but one of the things you can do, you can make it very visual. And all you need for that is simply to have this system of a piece of paper, which you have previously set up. What you would do is you would get a piece of, let me just see over here, which is, my photographer can do that better. What you do is you get a piece of graph paper which has boxes and with a little pen, you just draw on the graph paper, one, two, three, four, five, six. And if you had been at the uh, actual fair, I could have given you, I have many sheets of this all prepared, but if you wanna do it for yourself, I cannot do that on the computer or on the phone or on the camera. So you'll have to do it for yourself. Get a piece of graph paper and just draw 
one, two, three, four, five, six circles. And then you can take it to a Xerox or a copy machine and make many, many blank pages. And so what's interesting about this is at the fair, I would give out pages like this to the multitudes that would come by. And then with the addition of these little dots, these self-stick dots, you can create words. And let me show you how easy it really is. Dot number six, that means it's a capital. It means what's coming next is a capital. Now, remember dot one and two? What was that? That was a B. So that's going to be a B. And the R, I'll put this right here so you can find it for yourself. Can you see the R? Then dot number one, A. The I is dot number two and number four. And then that L, which is the same as the B with dot number three, two L's, and there's your E, and it says Braille. So you can send a message if you take the blank sheet and add some of these little dots, and you can write a message. Now, we'll put the alphabet underneath, and let's see if you can read that. H. E, L, L, O, hello. Now let's see if you can read another one. H, O, L, A. It says hello also, but it's in Spanish, hola. So that this visual braille, which I hope that you're enjoying, you can write other languages, you can write French, Spanish, anything that you can transliterate into the alphabet, you can write in this visual braille. And let's see what else we have here. We have a few other locally. Ah, now here's a very interesting possibility. You don't have these dots, but you do have a colored pencil or pen so you can fill in the dots once you have the blank sheet you can fill in the dots with a pen a b c d i think you know where this is going don't you e f g and you can fill it in with a pen or pencil. So let's do a little bit more, and we'll see if you can read some of these other messages which people have sent over the years, because I think it's kind of fun. Now the dot six is a capital. E, R, E, S, M, U, Y, E, S, P, E, C, I, A, oh, we have more Spanish. Eres muy especial. You are very special in Spanish. Isn't that nice? Let's see what's next. You don't always have to use red. The green works nicely too. We have another one here. Just get it in the right spot here. H, A, P, P, Y, H O L I D A Y S, Happy Holidays. Can you read Happy Holidays? Okay. Now, here's something that I did want to make a special point of showing you. When you are doing visual braille, see how confusing this is with green and red and all that? It's really better to stay with one color for the entire message if you're doing visual braille. Because although it's readable, it's not easy. It says C-H-E-E-R-S, cheers. But it's a little hard to read because the colors distract you. I'll just show you a few more because these are kind of fun. Now this is one that many people will keep writing and send all the time. I 
L O V E. And what's next? It's not I love you. I love A R T. I love art. Isn't that nice? And another one that I think you might enjoy. Can you read this one? A R T E E S V I D A. Arte es vida. Art is life. Another Spanish one. And that's supposed to be a dot. A dot is a lower D. This is a mistake, but that's okay. I don't think we'll do too many more, but I would like to show you that it doesn't have to be on white paper. It can be kind of nice. This is a nice one. C O M O Como E S T. Ah! <gasps> It should be an A there. Como estas? How are you in Spanish? That's a mistake. But all you have to do is you pull up the dots and put the correct dot in. I would peel this off and put the right one in. That's how you can erase and correct in visual braille. I wanted to show you just one or two more because I thought that they were kind of nice. This is a different grid. A different person created the grid. L O V E L I L I Love Lily. And she wrote below, she wrote Love Lily. But I want to show you something special about this one. Look down here, 11, 11, oh, 03. That means that she wrote this at the fair, at the holiday fair of the Society of Scribes in 2003. That means we've been doing Braille for a long time. And I hope that you've enjoyed it, but I just want to show you a last one here. No, that's not the one. That's not the one. I think it's this one. Yes. Can you read this one? Can you read it without the guide? T H A N K S. Thanks. F O R. Thanks for coming. And I'm thanking you for coming. And down on the bottom, this is an interesting thing. You see how she put the person who did this, she put the little dots just writing it with a pen without any grid. And that's how you can actually do it if you want. You can leave the grid out and just put the little dots in once you've memorized the alphabet. I hope it's been enjoyable. I've enjoyed showing it to you. I really love Braille. I really like doing it. I like reading it. And it's a way to communicate. Also, if you happen to be a teacher or run into uh, an, a situation where you uh, encounter a person who cannot see, you have something in common and you can really expand your experience that way. And I think it's, uh, it's a lovely thing to do. Remember, it's not calligraphy, but it's writing. And I hope you enjoyed it, and I'm going to say bye. So hi everybody, I'm Barry Morenz, member of the Board of Governors of the Society of Scribes. And this afternoon, it is my pleasure to lead you through the world of what I call glorious Gothic capitals. Gothic caps are indeed the scribes delight. They can be very fanciful, they can be very elegant, playful, voluptuous, luxurious, rich, uh, frivolous. The sky's the limit what they can be. It all depends on the nature of the strokes 
and I'm going to show you how you can begin with a simple capital I, a Roman I or an Uncial I, and how we can add some of the various components that go into making up a Gothic capital. So you can add any one or sometimes two or even three of these elements to the basic capital and you can impart a much greater flavor to them, to it, I should say. So as I said, we'll start off very simply. Can't get much simpler than this, a simple until I, or a Roman capital I, by adding a simple foot, double stroking. In this case, the second stroke, the pen angle has been steepened considerably. That imparts greater contrast to it. Here I'm curving out on the bottom, going back on the edge of my pen and quickly pulling out that hairline which in this case we would call a spur. Here I've built up the bottom a bit more, made it very much like a, I believe a textura quadrata, that black letter alphabet of the late 12th, early 13th century. This is something I might do to an ascending stroke. Again, pull out a spur on top and pull it out to the left-hand side. Here I bent the vertical and turned it into an OG shape. Here again, doubled up on it, steepened the pen angle for the second stroke. Here I've completely built it up. So I went back into the first stroke, came down to the left and curved back into it. So that's building it up. Kicking up on the edge of the pen, for a spur, here a half diamond shape, again double stroking. This is very, very medieval and even early Renaissance to sometimes break up the vertical stroke and put a diamond in the center. This is something I might do to a flourish letter. And if it works on a capital, I would do it too. Here we see a simple vertical stroke with three half diamonds coming out of the stem. Here I just did a column of diamonds unconnected. And that could be fun. Here I've turned them into a sort of ribbon type of look. Here it's exaggerated. <clears throat> so something like this might work very well for a very large introductory capital. Sometimes in a poem, you might have the lead capital be two or even three lines in depth. So then you can do a very weighted capital letter like this with heavier strokes and rather exaggerated. These are simply decorative elements by moving, by moving the pen very quickly, either up or down the page, curving off and you get that very nice little fishtail on the bottom or on the top. Here, adding diamonds to them. Here, we're just making marks. These are flourishes. So I might attach this flourish to the beginning of a B or a D or a P. We'll see as we move along. So here you can see how I've, whoops. <laughs> Started off with a C, it's almost a C. So this could be an E shape or an O shape or a G shape. And here a suspended bracket, very Gothic. Here I've raised the bracket above the beginning of the C and then steepened the pen and did a hairline. Here the top is very curved or curled. So getting that little spur on top gives it a decorative flavor. Here, now you might mistake this for a minuscule E, but it's not. It's actually part of the body of a capital C or an E. But I sometimes 
curve the bracket, as I have here, and pull it through the stem or the vertical. Here it's exaggerated all the more. <clears throat> here I've come down, cut through the body, and then shot right back up on the edge of my pen and pulled that out. So that's a nice decorative element. Here it's exaggerated once again. Here I've changed it to the three diamonds. Let's see what else. So I think they're pretty self-explanatory by this stage. Here I've turned that bracket into something like a candelabra. Did a little decorative flame on top of it. Very elaborate E here. Uh, first stroke is bent, curving out for a spur. Second stroke is a steepened pen. So you have greater contrast. Here I'm just pulling up out of the pen to get this decorative element up here. Here I've changed the crossbar into a thin line with two diamonds. Here I've changed the nature of the M from a very straight stroke to an OG type, OG shape. OG is like an S shape. And let that serve as the beginning of my M. And that could apply to any one of a number of other letters as well. It could be an N, for example. Here in the D, it's a little more elaborate than usual. But you see, I'm very often just playing around and experimenting. And sometimes I really hit the mark and come up with something quite creative and very attractive. And if I think it works, I'll then work it into my regular repertoire of forms. And many times they don't work. That's part of the fun of playing around to see what you get. Here's a rather fractured type of E, but it's very interesting because of the counter spaces. You're letting air in, you're letting it breathe, and it's quite fun. This S has a fair amount of pen manipulation and twisting going on. So we can create these very beautiful shapes here. Here, the ribbon type of column for the T. Here, I've broken up the X. As I have with the Y. It's absolutely unlimited. If you are limited, you are limited only by the extent of your imagination. So let yourself go. If you have an idea, go for it. Give it a shot and see what you get. But you will be having fun. And as I said, every now and then it's going to be, oh, wow, look what I just created. That's really beautiful. So I'm going to demonstrate a number of the letters. I wish I could do variations of each of the 26 letters. But if I did that, we would be here until Christmas of next year, because as I said, it's just seemingly infinite. So let's get started now with some pen and ink. So I'm now going to demonstrate glorious Gothic capitals. They can be built up from a basic Roman or uncial or italic form applying any one of a number of Gothic elements. The brackets, the fine lines, the diamonds, the parallel lines within a counter shape, uh, changing the nature of the stroke from a rigid vertical to a more curvilinear type. The sky's the limit. So I'm going to write with two different size, uh, two different pens. They're both parallel pens, but one is the number six, the solid edge, and the other is also a number six, but it's the split pen. So we'll get a double line, which is very nice. So I'm gonna start off with a very sort of eclectic type of G shape. You tend to see this in late 13th, 14th century English manuscripts. 
So this would serve as an O or an O shape, which could be used for the G, for the C, for an E, etc. Now I'm going to switch to the split pen. Make a half diamond on the bracket. I'm going to come up on the edge of the pen and then swing across. Now for contrast sake, I'll do a more rounded type of O and curve that bracket and flourish it a little bit. So that makes it very decorative. Characteristic of black letter capitals is to have two parallel lines within the counter and then a little square within those parallel lines. Sometimes I will flatten my pen to the center part of R and then come down like so. In this counter shape here, well, we can put a little decoration. Going to start off my eye with a flourish. Two half diamonds, you can do one, you can do two, you can do three, it doesn't really matter. It's what looks good that counts. Now I'll go back to this funky shape for the O. Do a ribbon type of bracket. I came down and then I curved out the bit to the left. So that gives it a little freedom, a little more visually interesting. Now the S. Diamonds in the center. Now Gothic. So I'm going to do a straighter type of O shape here now. And let's see, for the bracket, we can do diamonds. Now on the top line, that part of the G, I swung out to the left. Here I'm going to go into the right. Doesn't really matter, but just for some variety. Steep in the pen, do a parallel vertical stroke. It makes it a little more visually interesting. It's a sort of minuscule form, but I'm letting it serve as a capital. You'll very often see that in medieval manuscripts. Notice a difference in feet between this I and the T. Here it's a straight serif. Here I've curved it down, full width pen. So that's very Gothic in flavor. And then the C. Let's make the C more rounded. Alert from Google Chrome, Fox News. Oh, 
no capitals. So let's start off with the split pen here. Now I'm going to do an uncial type of A. And swing that out. And I can just do a diamond to serve as the crossbar. Oh, let's fracture this part of the P a bit. Uh, the eyes that I've done so far have been straight, so let's play dangerously and make it a little curvy. Still read it as an eye. Uh, let's do an uncial type of T. Now for this A, I'll revert to an italic type of cap. Make it gothic by pulling down that hairline stroke with a little diamond. Turn the pen very steeply, the crossbar and make that. Now L. Not too much you can do with an L. You play around by exaggerating the uh, leg a bit, but not much else. Now let's do a very typical black letter type of S. So I'm getting a little straighter now. Now I'm going to roll around onto the left-hand corner of the pen and aim for that diamond in the center, come through it, down through the bottom, and loop around and join up. So there we have some glorious Gothic capitals. And in a moment, I'm going to do some color blending i work with several different colors and we'll just play around and that adds to the glory, to the greater glory of these wonderful letter forms. So hang in there and we shall return. I'm now going to demonstrate some color blending by working with a Mitchell number zero pen. Well, one, one or zero, zero. And um, a fun manner to get some really dazzling color effects. So I'm going to write with uh, somewhat dirty water and very quickly drop in another color. And they will blend rather mysteriously, unpredictably. You don't want to have too much water as I do have here. You can see it strokes are not as crisp as they ought to be. Uh, but what we can do is write full, uh, full opacity. Slip your pen into some water and go back into the wet stroke and pull out of it. So as you see, as it's thinner, it picks up whatever color was in the pen before, or you can touch 
another color and while it's still wet go back into it now you just want to skim the surface of your water jar to pick up the color otherwise it'll be too wet All right, that's a yellow. I dipped in very, very lightly. To be very careful when you do that, because otherwise it'll really muddy up your colors. So if you know your colors, if you know exactly how to control it, you can sometimes get away with doing these somewhat unorthodox uh, methods. but that's rather nice the way that blended there bear in mind that they always look better when they're still wet somehow or other when they dry they lose some of that really uh, pristine beauty that they had initially which is okay they'll still look very good but um they look a little different when when wet so now what i'm going to do is I'm dipping into my red, and at the same time, I just charged a brush with some yellow, and I'm putting it in the nib, but behind the reservoir. That is to say, I put it in over here, behind the reservoir. So as the pen comes on the page, uh, the medium will start to flow and blend in with the first color, which was the red. Of course, it's not quite happening here just because I wanted to, but so let's add a little more yellow. can also touch the tip of the pen with the alternative color. There we go. Now I'm gonna just tip in to the green. I tipped in with the left hand corner of the pen now i just tipped into the water again so this will be more watery obviously more watery i tipped into the water as you can see the blending going on there now go in there with the yellow i'm going to pull out of that Ooh. Look at the nice sort of marbleizing look that we're getting here. It's very subtle. But when it's working the right way, that is to say, when you have everything mixed with the right consistency and the flow 
you'll get some very beautiful effects. But you have to play around with this in order to really get it working. I can do this with gouache as well. Somehow I have a little more control with the gouache because it's a bit thicker than these inks. Are. These inks, by the way, are Zillas, which I'm very fond of. They're beautiful colors and they blend very nicely. And they come probably in about 20 different colors now. Oh, now look at that. Have the red and the orange, have the reddish orange, picked up some of the green. So you have the edge of that stroke is darker. Take up a little more water now. And I'll drop in some color into that. It's another alternative color into that. That's a yellow, and I'm going to pull out of there with the yellow. So the top now has that marbleized look to it. Now let's see. I think I'll pick up some blue. Well, there's still enough of the red and yellow in there to prevent the blue from looking as blue as it can. There we go. Now, if they're not all that crisp, and by this I mean it's a little thick over there, it's because it's a little too watery. So again, when you're going to sit down and do something in earnest, you really have to try out your tools first and see what's working best. But eventually you will get the total control over it. Um, I can guarantee you that. I've played around with these often enough. I know that in the beginning it sometimes not going to work quite the way I want it, but after playing around with it a bit, I do achieve the results that I'm looking for. Now, another thing you can do is go back with a gel pen. They come in zillions of colors. I like working with gold. And you can do some simple filigree work around with the letters. Just sort of like figure eights, semicircles, etc. In these counters, you can quickly pull out a straighter stroke. Here's a figure eight. And again, a glorious copy capital. Look what happened over here gold pen this letter a was still somewhat wet so the gold picked up a bit of that color in the flourish stroke and that's rather nice so I like that. again this is good for doing really playful stuff if you're going to do a very important manuscript use discretion it can look very effective but sometimes it just might be a bit too much so i leave it to you to decide But this is all very simple just to do these semicircles. They can overlap, cross over into the letter. And they look so complicated, and yet they're really not. So there we have it. Some simple capitals decorated with Gothic elements, and they become considerably more elaborate and oh so fun. So enjoy.
Hello participants, welcome to the Simple Holiday Ornament class. Let's start with the layout basics for the ornament. The tighter you make your layout, the better the results. So for a Christmas ball approximately two and a quarter inches in diameter, a two and five eighths inch by two and an eighth inch area works really well. I have mapped out my elements on a tissue and centered them on layout. You can see the center line right here. And all I have to do is line that up with my dotted lines. And I can put an overlay tissue on the gridded sheet and copy it here, make a clean copy so that when I remove this, you can see how everything fits in. And this is what I am going to use as a map to create my Christmas ornament. Next, I cut a quarter inch by four inch strip of grid paper. For purposes of the video, I put a strip of colored paper behind it so it was easier for you to see. I aligned the grid paper to the layout and put tick marks on it according to the elements I want on the ball. The top of the grid paper will be placed at the base of the ornament hanger for measuring. First, clean your hands of any oils and or use the white gloves. Use your measuring strip and white pencil to create your layout with light pressure. Use dashes rather than solid lines. Make sure your layout is centered you are working on a curved surface, so it is essential to always measure from the base of the hanger as you work your way around the ball. Once you have created your layout and drawn it on your ornament, you are ready to write your message. Use your Nico G nib and Dr. Martin's white paint. Write slowly on the ornament and let dry. Next, take the number two or three brush and using the white acrylic paint, paint the tree's undercoat and let dry. Give this a second coat of white and let that dry. The snow under the tree is achieved by laying down white paint, rinsing the brush with clean water, blotting the brush just a bit on a paper towel and running that under the white paint so that it bleeds. Next, paint the tree's branches using your medium green and blending in a bit of the dark green acrylic here and there. You may want to turn your ornament upside down to make the branches more even. Let dry. You can also leave a little white paint at the ends of the branches or dab it in later to represent snow. Last, put some Christmas balls on the tree using your yellow, blue, and red acrylic paints and your Nico G nib. 
Don't forget to add a star at the top of your tree with the yellow paint and your nib. Gently dab off your guidelines when finished with the kneaded eraser. Congratulations, you have created your first ornament. Here are a few samples of layouts and ornaments I have painted over the years. Once you get comfortable, you can really make them personalized and detailed. Good luck and have fun. Hello everyone at Society of Scribes. Uh, my name is Lin Yoon and I'm a type designer, calligrapher, and educator. And today I'm very excited to share with you some examples from work from European writing masters. So let's dive right into it. With the invention of printing, you can sort of imagine uh, this is when the era of writing masters start. So you can think of how the invention of printing must have uh, spurred scribes to start looking for a new career, so to speak. And the writing master period starts um, from about Arigi, which is like 1500s, to perhaps the 17th century or so. There's no defined period, but this is the period that I'm thinking about when I'm explaining this to you. So you can um, imagine when printing came around. So here is the first printed book in Europe, Gutenberg's um, Bible from 1455. And you can imagine that at this time, printing is still used for limited uh, things. For instance, it was being used for um, literature, Latin text, uh, you know, religious texts and so forth. But you can't imagine that people in this day and time are trying to use type for things such as um, legal pieces of writings, correspondence, or um, lightweight commercial things, right? So you can imagine that there's still a huge need for writing and scribes turn into writing masters and they start teaching people how to write. And Italy was a huge hub for writing masters. And this is uh, La Operina, uh, the first writing manual. And this is the first book also to be devoted to writing the Italian uh, style uh, known as Italic or Chancery Cursive. So this is a woodblock book 
So you can see that the writing is itself is pointed, but also probably a little bit exaggerated because this is wood type and uh, the cutting process uh, would have made it look a little bit sharper. And then the very second writing manual was published in the very next year, 1523 by Irigi again. And there's a lot more examples of different kinds of writing in this um, in this manual. And you can see that he teaches you everything from how to cut the pen into all these different styles. And another very well-known writing master at this time is Tagliente. So Origi, if you um, try to read the rumors of that time, um, is said to have rushed his book in order to beat Tagliente to be the first writing manual ever. Whether or not this is true, we're not really sure. But what is um, very much true is that Tagliente has an amazing writing manual. And here you can see all the different styles that Tagliente is showing off in this writing manual also. So here you can see uh, Roman capitals, which writing masters back in the day thought every good writing manual should have. And then that brings us to the third great penman of the Italian Renaissance, who is uh, Palatino. And um, again, really, really beautiful um, works of art really <laughs> um, shown. And it's not just Latin, uh, Latin letters. You can see that there is um, a variety of different scripts going on here. And if you're interested in these three Italian writing masters, I highly recommend this book by Oscar Ogg, The Three Classics of Italian Calligraphy. Now, um, in, um, let's mention uh, Cresci, uh, Giovanni Francesco Cresci, the Vatican scribe who was a master calligrapher who made important changes to chancery cursive. And you might know um, Cresci's work for the clubbed serif, like the little bunny ears that is shown here. And let's look at writing masters of the North. So the German speaking areas of the North um, concentrated on the Gothic black letter and variations of it. The first printed German writing manual is credited to Johann Neudorfer the Elder, who printed a six page specimen of fracture in uh, 1519 at the age of 22. And uh, this is from plates that he etched and the funny thing about writing manuals in the earlier days is that there wasn't a uh, go-to method, a standardized method for printing these. And you can see that no uh, Johann Neudorfer printed these uh, backwards. So this is what you would have seen where the, uh, the original um, etched plates would have touched uh, the paper. And so he would have written right side up and then he used a paper that was thin enough that it would soak through and then this would be the side that you would be reading, right? But it was actually the back of the paper that it was printed in. And I believe this is at the um, Metropolitan Museum. Um, at least there's an exhibit of it. <laughs> and here is uh, Wolfgang, Wolfgang Worker. Um, sorry, pronunciation is not my strongest suit. Um, he was a student of Neudorfer's, and this is a very interesting manual for folks who are also interested in type because uh, he was also a printer. And this is one of the first writing manuals where the, um, the, the pen met uh, the possibilities of type, so to speak. So he presents writing as uh, examples of type specimens rather than pure uh, penmanship let's say. And so he was intending this manual to be for punch cutters to also reference. And it was the one of the first manuals of its kind. Um, so that's very interesting for me as um, a type designer also. Uh, here is the well-known and well-loved Mira Calligraphiae. I think there is a new uh, reproduction book from Getty that's out. And this is uh, from uh, 1561 to 1562. The 
uh, Georg Bakske, the Croatian-born court secretary to the Holy Roman Emperor Ferdinand I, I think, um, created this book uh, to demonstrate his technical mastery in uh, Vienna. And the illustrator came in almost three decades later to uh, create this beautiful works of art on top. And Germany and the Austro-Hungarian Empire didn't really adopt the round hand um, unlike the neighboring countries such as uh, France, Spain, and England. Um, I put neighboring in uh, the relative sense, of course. Um, it, this is very interesting because they continue their own writing traditions uh, based on Gothic scripts. So this is current or German cursive. And this is it zoomed in just in case you want a, uh, <laughs> a closer up view. And it's, um, I mean, there's a lot of really great works that are um, nestled in in these manuals. It's, there's a lot of one upsmanship, let's say, where everyone is trying to show off the most complicated thing they can do on top of trying to recruit students. So uh, a lot of writing manuals had a lot of fantastic flourishes such as these. And uh, that brings us to the writing masters of Holland. Uh, Jan van den Velde is probably the most famous of the Dutch masters. It's probably someone you think of when you think of writing masters, like, oh, this piece is probably what you think of. And as a writing manual should, it teaches you how to write. And this is where you see that the writing master um, is trying to teach the student how to write. So you can see on the top row, uh, this is how you write a G. You uh, write the first uh, left side and then you finish it upwards and then you draw the top stroke. So you can see that it's almost like a snapshot of, of each letter in its stages. Um, and there were so many excellent Dutch writing masters uh, around this time, but the only woman among them um, in this time, um, so like the the late 16th century to maybe like the mid 17th century, um, the only woman among them was Maria Strick. And her work is astounding. Um, she was the daughter of Caspar uh, Beck. I'm probably also um, mispronouncing names here. Um, uh, so Jan van der Velde's teacher um, had a daughter, and that is Maria Strick. And her husband beautifully engraved all these copybooks for her and uh, refused to work for other writing masters. And <laughs> sorry I'm rushing through because this is a very um, supposed to be a very condensed talk. Um, and here we here brings us to the writing masters of Spain. Um, uh, Juan, uh, Juan de... Sorry. Uh, Iacar uh, pro produced the first Spanish writing manual in 1548, and so this is cut out of wood blocks. The second is Francisco Lucas, and scholars credit him with the Spanish uh, Bastarda. So at this time, there's a lot of movement from all these different countries to capture their national characteristics in their writing. And so this is uh, what the, uh, the writing master at the time thought captured the Spanish spirit, so to speak. And then we have the writing masters of France. So here is Geoffrey Torres Saint Fleury, um, just a beautiful, beautiful bastarda. And Louis Barbador is a French writing master that popularized the round hand in France. And he was officially assigned the task of writing the examples that were to serve as models throughout the kingdom. It's kind of amazing how many um, scribes just like were directly commissioned by the royals at this stage, right? And at this time, the French government had decided to trim down the number of uh, hands practiced in France to only two hands. Uh, the first was uh, the round hand that we just saw, and the second was the batard financier, um, which means like the financial hand. And so like that was modeled by uh, a different guy, but um, a, a teen de Beligny. Oh, sorry, my American pronunciation. But <laughs> uh, Louis Barbador um, is a big name um, amongst the French writing masters for this reason. And uh, last but not least, we have the writing masters of England. Uh, here is Edward Cocker's uh, Penn's Transcendency of 1657. And 
um, John Ayers is, is given credit for developing the new English round hand that you are seeing here. Now, um, I mean, the round hands look sort of similar. And uh, this, you know, as I was saying before, this is a time when uh, a lot of people were fixated with like capturing their national spirit. So um, this is what he developed uh, as a, a round hand that captures the, um, the British spirit, so to speak. And um, there's uh, there. I've read some books where the drama amongst uh, writing masters uh, would be really big, and the English uh, writing masters would have like the biggest uh, spats, so to speak. Um, <laughs> and um, anyhow, uh, here is Charles Charles Snell, another uh, big name in the world of uh, penmanship. Uh, this is the book Penman's Treasury. And then here is George Bickham, and you might know him for the Universal Penman. Uh, he was a very prolific engraver first and foremost, and he engraved um, probably like the majority of the best copy books um, in his era. So like the early 1700s to maybe mid 1700s, I want to say. And this is uh, the Universal Penman book that a lot of people have. It's very affordable. Um, if you're interested in um, the you know, this uh, reference, it's such a great one to get, and it's very inexpensive as well. And, you know, um, this is a George Shelley's uh, example, and, uh, you know, speaking about drama, this piece was very, very heavily criticized um, for not being legible at all. <laughs> and I can't really... Um, I can't really defend that, you know, like it, it sort of seems like the flourishes are so overpowering the letters, like it's actually impeding with the ability to read. Um, <laughs> and so in time, uh, you see writing masters themselves uh, change also. So this is the same person, George Shelley, and years later, you can see that he has adopted a more... Uh, distinct approach in how he organized the letters versus the flourishes. So over time, the sh you probably have noticed that the showmanship sort of takes over the writing itself. And this is why the writing master era is still heavily criticized to this day. And engraving was a very dominant way of making these uh, books, especially later after uh, woodblock printing was no longer used. And the downside of this was that the art itself wasn't preserved very much. So you can imagine that once uh, the copy book was made and the plates were made, um, the, the originals were sort of tossed aside because they weren't regarded as things of value. And because in the engraving process, things can get machined down and corrected to mechanical perfection, um, often the originals for these are lost and the human hand starts to get a little bit lost. Um, so the criticism for the writing master era is that the human hand is, is a little bit more lost in the later eras than how it you know, used to be in the earlier ones that you were looking at during the Italian Renaissance. If you want to find out more about these writing masters, uh, here are great resources that I highly recommend. And I know I was flying through a lot of things, but I hope um, you found this interesting um, just as much as I did. Thank you very much.
Hi everyone, I'm Olivia. I'm a freelance graphic designer, letterer, and calligrapher. I'm also a member of Society of Scribes. My journey into calligraphy started when I was a senior at Pratt Institute during my undergrad. I was so lucky to have Christopher Calderhead as my calligraphy uh, instructor. And so we learned two broad-edged hands. We learned a uh, black letter as well as a Roman foundational hand. My talk today is about how I've adapted typefaces and lettering into calligraphy alphabets. My interest in adapting letter forms into different mediums certainly was apparent in college. I was always trying to take digital uh, letter forms from typography and see what I could do by manifesting them into physical letter forms. And so I think this is kind of me iterating on that process, except adapting you know, digital typography into uh, handwritten calligraphy. So after college, um, since I was so lucky to have gotten the Society of Scribes scholarship, I was able to take such a variety of courses. And I kind of went all out. I was taking broad edged pen courses, I was taking pointed pen courses, um, all sorts of hands and alphabets coming from different places and histories. And so I just I loved that I was learning, you know, how to write an alphabet in 10 different ways, according to whatever hand I was studying that day. It was a really rewarding experience. And ultimately, I think because I was so interested in learning all these hands, I maybe was less interested in like honing the craft of one particular style. Like I never found a loyalty to one style the way people do. And I could see this being as my weakness because I wasn't able to like properly craft one single hand and master it. But I think that this inclination led me to start exploring different avenues of calligraphy to make it um, kind of feel more more similar to my other creative processes with typography and design. And while I was taking these Society of Scribes classes, I was going to a lot of talks about innovative creators in the typography field. And I was seeing typefaces and styles that I've never come across before. Um, notably, I came across Inkwell and the black letter style of Inkwell by Heffler & Co. and Mirian Text Black, released by Commercial Type. Both of these black letter, both of these nothing like the black letter I learned to write by hand. And so I think I was kind of immediately fascinated. I started looking at Mirian pretty closely. I was obsessed with the lowercase s. It just like turns and pivots and your eyes constantly traveling. And so I'm showing some of my sketchbooks from me just taking a look at the different letter forms, sketching them out very roughly. Um, nothing is perfected here, but I wanted to see what alphabet I could create on my own. And so I was like compulsively sketching in my sketchbook to see how I could figure this out, how I could verse engineer all of these letter forms and I was creating stuff that I've never seen before in my calligraphic eyes, a skeletal black letter. It was quite strange. And I soon abandoned the project, but I think it really, empowered me to uh, look at different typefaces and think about how I could adapt them and make them my own and how they would live in this different hand created format. I revisited this idea uh, this past year. There's another black letter adventure I decided to go on. I really loved Sharp Type's Respira Black. It was a really unusual black letter that had so much dignity and felt contemporary. I loved that there was curves to the black letter. Um, it really brought some humanity to it that I was sometimes missing in the more traditional styles. And so I also was obsessed with this uppercase S and I decided, hey, I could figure this out. I know how to use a parallel pen and figure out pen angle. And so that's kind of how I approached it. I think I just started with this uppercase S, see if I could execute it um, to a similar degree. You know, I think there was mechanical limitations that I had using a parallel pen rather than having the computer and using Bezier curves. But um, ultimately I was able to create this S and then I moved on from there. I started looking at how to reverse engineer the lowercase minuscule school letters. And there were definitely some things I had to decide to forego, uh, like the dot of the eye. I don't know if I was able to capture or the little serifs that, you know, are easy to add into a typeface, but not so simple with a parallel pen. And so ultimately I decided what to keep, what to get away. And that's how I landed on my alphabet. Um, this one a little bit more crafted and, and obviously more finished than the one before. I used it to create name cards for my friends. Um, and then ultimately brought it into an envelope project I did. And as you can see, I really have no allegiance to any 
calligraphic style. I have a broad edged pen on here, pointed pen, uh, a handful of flourishes that I learned from Heather Held's class, um, which I loved. And so I think I am starting to finally approach calligraphy in a way that was similar to my other creative process that felt really me, that explored different typographic textures um, and little nuances and quirks. Um, and so I continued this process. I really loved the type family Quick and it's designed by Philip Herman, and it was so fascinating. The capital letters carried the sturdiness of, you know, brush marker lettering, yet there was whimsical nature to it that I hadn't seen before in a typeface. Um, and so I wanted to figure out what made it so whimsical, um, what made it so characteristic. I was examining the why, for example, how it's not just one straight line as the stem, it kind of undulates. And the crossbar to the E and the F is more of a quick flick rather than a straight uh, horizontal line. And so that influenced uh, this piece I made that was a Twin Peaks quote um, and some other explorations I really enjoyed. And so, you know, brush marker is definitely the medium I have the least experience with, but I always have the most fun with. Um, so it, it even allowed me to gain some confidence in a hand that I thought was kind of mysterious to me. And so I was able to learn a new level of comfort in this uh, tool and then also kind of make it in a way that felt contemporary and really close to my heart and my style. And so my last project is the work I did for Be OK Collective. They are a mental health initiative that focuses on making mental health resources accessible and approachable and busting mental health stigma. And so I was designing a collaboration package where I designed a postcard and a sticker um, to send to people. And if people donated to the organization, they'd get sent the sticker and the postcard and a custom envelope. So. I already knew that this brand was young, it was approachable, we did not want to go formal with it. And so I had to figure out how to uh, best express this uh, need. And I noticed across the internet, there was a lot of letters and calligraphers that were taking sans serif alphabets and creating them with broad edge tools, whether that be a marker or a pen. Um, and I was curious about maybe adapting this to the envelopes in a way that sans serif felt young, it felt modern, um, but doing it with calligraphy kind of also felt new to me. So I took a look at what people were doing and seeing how they did their process. And I wasn't quite finding an alphabet that I liked. I actually experimented with this alphabet here, Marvin Visions, but I think the style was a little bit too uh, specific to work with what I was doing. And I also felt like maybe if I went to a, a paint marker, it wouldn't feel so formal. And so I was watching <laughs> this TV show, Lovecraft Country. It was a very subversive science fiction show, and I was obsessed with the title slides I was seeing. I don't know if they were from a typeface or lettering. If anyone knows, let me know. Um, but I took screenshot of the title slides and was thinking, okay, this is condensed sans serif, so I could, you know, make it really bold and large across the envelope um, and still fit uh, people's last names. And so I started experimenting with recreating this alphabet. Ultimately, what was used on the packages was a more geometric version and sometimes varying in width depending on the length of the last name. Um, but I felt like I was able to create something pretty unique to the brand, to the project, and um, everyone was pretty happy with how they turned out. And so now I have a new alphabet I can keep with me in the future. So I think my major regret is that I didn't make specimens of all these alphabets. <laughs> you know, I think they never got past uh, explore and early execution phases. I never mastered them. It would definitely take me a little bit to pick them up again. So I think that that's where I need to improve on this process. But regardless, I think I've been able to learn so much along the way, you know, really think about my tools in ways I wouldn't have. I wouldn't have thought about using a broad edge tool for sans serif. And now I think I can try adapting so many alphabets using this method. And I wanted to share my story so other calligraphers felt inspired to uh, take this route if they felt like they were in a creative rut and they wanted to experiment with new letter forms or new ways of making letters. Um, I think our possibilities are endless right now. And I certainly discovered that along the way. I do want to know none of this exploration would have been possible if I didn't have a really solid foundation um, in calligraphy, if I didn't take all those Society of Scribes classes. I had so many generous teachers along the way. I hope to, you know, give them some credit here, but 
it really has changed my path as a creative and I'm so fortunate for Society of Scribes. And so thank you all for listening and thank you to Society of Scribes for letting me present today. Hi everyone, my name is Jun Shen, and I'm not a calligrapher like many professionals who you'll be hearing from during this holiday fair. I'm just here to talk briefly about my experience with calligraphy from the perspective of a type designer. Dragonhead Snake Tail is the title of this short talk, and I'll explain this phrase later. I work full time as a type designer at Occupant Fonts. And I know that this audience, Society of Scribes members, know that type design does not equal calligraphy or lettering, but a lot of lay people confuse these things. So I just want to clarify that even though I'm a type designer who also does lettering, I had no prior training in calligraphy whatsoever, but I always admired it. While I was attending graduate school at Rhode Island School of Design, I tried multiple times to fit Richard Lipton's calligraphy workshop into my schedule, but never succeeded due to scheduling conflicts. This is Richard working on the custom calligraphy for the spine of the W.A. Duigan's book by Bruce Kennett. Richard knew that I had always wanted to try calligraphy, so it was actually him who recommended me to Society of Scribes for the Alice Scholarship. You all know her, of course. Alice Scholarship allowed me to enroll in various calligraphy classes and even get the course materials from John Neal Bookseller, all free of charge, which was amazing. So throughout the year, I managed to take five classes, and they are... Retro Deco with Gemma Black, Secretary Hand with Paul Shaw, Foundational Hand with Eleanor Winters, Copper Plague with Laura Di Piazza, and Italic Hand with Anna Pinto. I would have taken more classes had I not been living in Providence, Rhode Island at the time and had to commute by train on all those weekends. Anyway, I learned a broad range of things in these classes for instance, I now know that Mitchell's nibs are good for someone with a light hand because they're more flexible, so definitely not great for me, while brows and speedball are sturdier. I also learned that in secretary hand, some majuscules are simply doubles of minuscules. For example, this double FF form is a majuscule of the F. Really interesting. Here's a fun picture of Paul, Paul Shaw writing a message to Cyrus, my boss, in secretary hand. In the end though, what I gained through trying calligraphy went far beyond tips on nib choosing and mini lessons in type history. I came to see that in both type design and calligraphy, having a sharp eye is critical. I would complete a practice sheet like this one, put my pen down and mark it up making notes on what to do differently next time. Just like the proofing process in type design. In this sense, being a type designer was helpful in the calligraphy classroom. I was quick to spot flaws when my inky letters were too narrow, too wide, too loose, too tight, too slanted, too upright, too round, too squarish, etc. Unfortunately, the ability to locate room for improvement did not automatically lead to a problem solved. Even if my brain knew what to do and what the letter I wanted to write looked like in my head, my hand wasn't on the same page. Motor skills are gained slowly through repetition. Hence the need to practice, right? They say practice makes perfect, but I found that practice makes practice. Perfect is not the goal anyway. 
even my teachers who have decades of experience write their letters differently every time. These variations do not take away from the work, however, uh, but rather they make it more special, more human. A piece of calligraphic work with quirks, even mistakes, unique to the hand that made it is not any less perfect, in my opinion, than a typeface with consistently smooth curves and programmed variations like stylistic and contextual alternates. The perfectness of the former lies in the evidence of the human hand and satisfying material tactility. Calligraphy is beautiful because it's done by hand. We live in an age where machines have lar largely replaced our hands. Our fingers are most accustomed to clicking and scrolling and double tapping to like. I confess there were moments during these calligraphy sessions when I wished I could just push that imaginary node over a few units or add a bit more slant to a stroke to make it the 45 degree angle specified for italic hand or just undo that last stroke like I can when I'm designing a typeface on the computer. I learned that in calligraphy, getting ready, filling up the water jug, getting some paper towels or rags, choosing a nib, uh, putting the reservoir on, pushing the nib into the holder, selecting an ink, pouring it into an inkwell, preparing the guidelines and placing it underneath the paper, adjusting the table height and angle, and cleaning up afterward, making sure the nibs are thoroughly cleaned and dried and putting everything away where they belong for the next time are all part of the practice. That was a long sentence. I've come to appreciate the amount of care that goes into every stage of the process. It turns the whole experience into a meditative ceremony of sort where there is no quick command Z. In this space, Everything is slower and a lot messier than in the digital environment. But if you're like me and spend most of your day in front of a screen, you just might find such an inconvenience delightful, if not necessary. As more and more things turn digital, I hope that younger generations get to experience the calm, but also the frustration that calligraphy brings and have a chance to develop the kind of patience and persistence needed to be any good at it. Nothing good comes easy, right? Growing up in Korea, where I'm from, I often heard the expression, Yongdusami. This is how it's written in Chinese. It translates to dragon head snake tail. The phrase is used to um, refer to something that starts out strong, but ends in an unimpressive fizzle. No offense to snakes. Can you think of a project you began with big ambitions and never finished? I can. This expression was what had come to my mind when my italic instructor Anna Pinto said, hold on to that last stroke. Don't give it up. Control it till the end. I think I was lifting the pen too soon. Here I wrote it out trying to control it till the end. As we near the end of this rough, rough year, I want to repurpose what Anna said and apply it to life at large. Especially this year, I know it's not easy to carry that last stroke with the same commitment with which we begin. But like Anna said, don't give up. Thank you for listening and stay safe, everyone. I'm Christopher Calderhead, and this is my collaborator. Anna Pinto from Hoboken, New Jersey. 
right? I'm from Astoria, New York, and uh, we're here to uh, just introduce our uh, collaboration this year, but we thought we would talk a little bit about what we've been doing for the last 10 years. Yeah, we, uh, we made a very short slide presentation of a few of our uh, collaborations. Um, every year we choose a very simple palette and uh, use materials that we have lying around the house. And we choose a theme and ask participants at the holiday fair to respond to the theme. And then we write things and we pass it back and forth and add things. And at the end we have a something <laughs> and we auction it off to benefit the society in the following year. So here we have um, a marionette or <laughs> or a paper doll. <laughs> we've been arguing about whether it's a marionette or a paper doll. And this was probably one of the most complicated projects we did, wouldn't you say, Christopher? I'd say absolutely. Uh, just the fact that it was very large, it all had moving parts, all of the arms and legs move. Um, and uh, we weren't able to print it out on anything because uh, the printing paper comes out funky, so you can't do calligraphy on it. So we had to hand cut these at the holiday fair and then uh, start doing the pochoir work, uh, which is a kind of stenciling, um, to create the diamond patterns on the, on the figure. And here you can see us doing the pochoir stuff beforehand, before we started getting suggestions from um, fair goers. And the theme was, what was the best gift you ever received? And here you can see some of the responses we got. So like a lot of our collaborations, it's really nice to set a question for the audience, you know, for the people who come to the fair and then people write things down and we chat with them while they're writing things down. And then of course, it's all spontaneous. We just uh, react to whatever is right in front of us. And then uh, it's good or bad, whatever happens, happens. And we never really know how it will turn out or if it will turn out. Um. <laughs> it, I know it's always kind of nail biter. Mm. Uh, to see, all right, are we going to finish it or is it going to look good? Um, but uh, they've generally come out pretty good. Yeah. And also when we come up with the idea, we usually come up with something fairly quickly. We don't really fuss over it too much, I think. And um, it's been fun it has been, for, yeah. for that reason, because it hasn't been overly labored or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um this was our, I think it was our last collaboration, don't you think, Christopher? That was 2018. Mm -hmm. Last year we didn't, we didn't, weren't able to do one. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess it was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and this has a backstory because you had uh, wires lying around, mm -hmm. and they were from what? The spiral notebooks. Oh. I I couldn't resist them. I thought they were so interesting and sculptural looking. So every time I finished a spiral notebook, I'd or, you know, was getting rid of one, I would tear out the pages and then make something, you know, like just stick all of these uh, things together. Actually, you can see it here. Mm -hmm. So there were some white ones and black ones and metallic ones. And I thought, oh, here's a good way to use them. So going back one, the theme was free association, I think. That's right. So we gave people words to free associate against. Mm -hmm. And this is sort of our, our Dada Christmas wreath. Um, so we, we, we wove the whole thing into sort of a round wreathy thing. And then uh, we attached all of these little pieces that dangled from scarlet ribbons like this. Yeah. And we got interesting responses. Um, one of them was uh, Amazon because it was about when Amazon was planning to move into Astoria. So somebody responded with Wonder Woman and <laughs> someone else said, taking over the world. Right. So it, it, it was, it was fun. It was a lot of fun and unexpected. Yeah. <clears throat> and there's the final result. Yeah. Yeah. This was from 2011. 
And the theme was nature in New York, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> so we pre-cut all of these um, white leaves and they're, they're trees, the kind of street trees that you see in New York. So there's mm -hmm. a ginkgo and an oak and a plane tree. Um, Anna is pointing these out with her cursor. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> and then we asked people to react to the, the theme of nature in New York. What kind of mm -hmm. nature do you see in New York? Mm. Um, yeah, and we used just blue and green and white. And it might have been a pearlescent white. I can't remember. Mm. And then we had uh, silver washers to um, weight the strings that were tied to a piece of driftwood, which you can see here that we were holding. Yeah, because uh, the, the paper is so light that if we hadn't had some kind of weight on it, um, it, would, uh, it wouldn't hang properly. Yeah, so, just would have blown all over the place. So. Right. And then the washers are great because they, they're this little silver uh, sort of spangly thing that goes through the whole piece. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we often ha try to have one sort of sparkly thing or gold or silver or something just to uh, make it more festive. <clears throat> um, for example, here, this was from 2011. And um, we used ultramarine blue and gold and walnut ink, I think. That's right, yeah. yeah. And it was a piece of pergamonata, which is a fake parchment paper that I have. Mm -hmm. And I had dyed it with walnut ink. It takes takes dye very well. Mm -hmm. And we made a Mobius strip, right? Actually, we made two, didn't we? Yes. Did we? Yeah. Look. Oh, you're right. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> so whoever bought this at the holiday fair, I have no idea how that person has kept it or <laughs> displayed Actually, it. I do know. It was Lynn oh. Quayle, right. and she keeps it in a giant vase, a glass oh. vase, oh. and she rearranges it every so often so that you know, she sees different aspects of it. Right. I thought that was pretty clever. That is nice. Yeah. Yeah. And it was just before Obama's second, inaugur uh, second inauguration. So the theme was, what are your hopes for the new year? Mm. So, right. <clears throat> yeah. So we got, we got very interesting an answers, both personal and global. Right. In, in tone. Mm. And, and this is just, this gives you an idea of the scale. As I remember, that was nice to write on. It was very nice to write on. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Good. Uh, had a little bit of tooth to it. And yeah. <clears throat> I took the ink very well. Yeah. Mm. And here we are again, back mm. at the beginning. Right. <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about this year's collaboration. Mm -hmm. um, uh, <clears throat> so our, um, uh, <clears throat> sorry. Um, so uh, do you want to tell us what? Um... Well, since we had to do it virtually, we decided that we would ask, um, at least we hope this is <laughs> how it's going to work. <laughs> um, there's going to be a promo on the Society of Scribes Instagram, and uh, hopefully we'll get some comments from people about the upside of lockdown and what interesting discoveries they've made um, during these past eight months right. and things that they enjoyed that they didn't expect or... So we're going to be doing this. Uh, of course, you can see that we're not in the same place. Um, mm -hmm. We're all safely socially isolated from each other. Um, but uh, we're going to collaborate by working in our own locations and we're going to do writing and then we're going to scan it and exchange it, print it out. And each sheet that we do, uh, both of us will write on. So we'll react to each other's writing using the texts that people send us. Yeah. Yeah. And then once that's done, uh, we'll, we'll uh, take all of the digital files and we'll create a, a, a kind of quilt out of it, which yeah. hopefully will move. Um, but I <laughs> Because because it will be virtual, right? 
That's right, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. I've spent all day making a gift today. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm I'm sure I'll be I'll be very motivated to make the final gift of all of our calligraphy. <laughs> but I don't feel it right this very moment, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> well, hopefully you'll get a second wind. I'm sure I will, yes. Yeah. Yes. So I'm going to stop the share now and we'll say goodbye for the moment and bye for the moment and just wait and we'll hang on. Stay tuned. What happens in our collaboration? Okay. Right. Thank you all. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Christopher. All right. <laughs> Take bye care. Now. Hi everyone, thanks for tuning in today. Um, here I'm looking at the calligraphy that Christopher has done, which he scanned and emailed to me. And you can see there's quite a variety of things to play with here. Okay, this is an automatic pen that has a chip out of the middle, so I'll get a scroll-shaped stroke. to look like bird's feet when I was aiming for tail feathers. So maybe I need something that goes that way. There. The hardest thing is knowing when to stop. I think now is the time. Okay. The last piece from Christopher, Kindness of Strangers. Christopher now. Thanks for joining us. Well, hi, everyone. Um, I'm sitting here with uh, one of the pieces that Anna did, and she's taken uh, thanks to our medical heroes, and she's taken thanks to our essential workers. 
And um, so looking at uh, texts that people have sent us, um, I, someone sent in the words courage and hope were things that they got out of being on lockdown. So I'm thinking about how I want to add to this thing. And because Anna's already done this interesting uh, little game here of having these similar words, but flipping them. Um, I think I'm going to do something where I write courage and hope out like that and uh, or courage and courage and hope and hope. Um, so so I continue this sort of theme of, of upside down backwards and so on. Um, now, I've just got a few simple tools here. Um, I'm going to go for an edged pen, a nice thick one uh, for courage because <clears throat> I think it should be bold. And uh, so I'm going to tuck courage in right here, right between the two ascenders of the H and the K. Um, <clears throat> and let's do this in a nice, oh, I don't know. No, I'm going to do this one gothic. So I want, bump. Yeah, I like the boldness of that against the more delicate uh, italic, but courage. <laughs> let's make sure I spell it right. <laughs> Uh, this is just a printout, so if I screw up, then I can just print it out again and try again. Um, here we go. And of course, these uh, projects that Anna and I do uh, are very spontaneous. So, you know, you hope that you've planned ahead enough so that the word fits in the space. And I'm just coming in with just enough space for that E at the end. I, yikes. Boom. Of course, the beauty of being a calligrapher is that you can just sit down and knock it out sometimes there. Okay, a little lucky uh, lucky spacing. Okay, and I'm gonna repeat that over here. But I think <clears throat> I think instead of a Gothic for this one, I think I'm gonna do a, a condensed uh, Roman. So let's do courage that way here. So C, nice round, narrow C, courage. O, U, I always like that R-A combination, bump, bump. There we go. So there's courage. Now, hope strikes me as a word that's a little bit more, um, I don't know, delicate, ephemeral. So I think I'm going to use my uh, Japanese fountain brush. And I'm going to do hope. I'm going to do hope here, pointing the other way. And, um, and I think I'm going to do my scumbly technique. Um, so it's sort of like drawing the letters. You know, it's a little nice little serif, and then just fill in, chum, pom, pom, pom. fill in the letters. Chum, chum. Letting the brush make the thick strokes by building them up. And then a nice, whoop. let's do it again. Okay, and I think I'll do upper and lower case. So. I like this. So you, so you you have to you have to feel the shape as you go around it. Dun, 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 dun. And of course, with this technique, you know it doesn't have to be exactly perfect. A little serif. Dun, dun, dun. Up and around. Let it swell along its back. And then, dun, 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 dun. Oh, we'll do a nice little dot there. There we go. And now a nice chum. There we go. So there's hope. And since I'm mixing it up, um, maybe we'll do this one. Um, we'll do it the same tool again, but I think I'm going to do it in a, a sort of italic cap so oh 
I mean, this is really low stakes, isn't it? Right. Um, so <clears throat> we always hope they come out nice and they usually do, but if it's not perfect, that's, that's okay. It's funny. I feel like Bob Ross talking this way. Here's a pretty little tree here. You want a little tree there? Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> All right. Come, let it swell down the back. And then I think I'll do a round E just for the fun of it. Boom, boom, boom. Let those letters just dance a little bit. There we go. There's hope. And hope. And there we go. I think that's pretty good. All right. Whoops. Got to stop recording. If I can find where the button is. <laughs> there we go. It's up here. Okay, we'll pause it. All right, I'm back. <clears throat> so I'm looking at this one that Anna did. All right, watching a family of kestrels in the backyard while we have lunch. They have lunch too. And she's written grilled cheese, that's what the humans are having for lunch, and a mouse is what the kestrels are having for lunch. Um, <clears throat> and um, what am I going to add to this one? I, uh, I couldn't find anything of among the texts that we were sent that really fits this, but I have to say uh, my own experience of lockdown, um, I made sure that I bought fresh strawberries and I had fresh strawberries on my cereal every morning. And that is not something I do in normal times, but it seemed so luxurious to do that. So, um, so I'm gonna add having fresh strawberries on my breakfast cereal. Now, we've got a little bit of a composition problem here because Anna's taken the middle of the page. <clears throat> and I'm not quite sure where to put my text. But I kind of feel like, obviously, I want to use the two sides. So I have to think about the words, you know. So having fresh strawberries, we'll see how that happens, um, on my cereal. I think I'm going to do it like that, and we'll see how it works. <clears throat> And um, Anna has used, uh, looks like a Sharpie for most of this. Uh, so I don't want to use my Sharpie. I think I'm going to use a narrower edged pen. And I don't have a lot of space. Strawberries is going to be an interesting challenge over here. So I think I'm going to do a sort of pointed italic, real condensed, and see if that works. That's, that's the plan. So let's see. And I'm going to do it all lowercase, I think or minuscule if I want to be a proper calligrapher. So having fresh strawberries, and I want strawberries to come below kestrels. So having fresh, okay, so let's, let's not overthink it. Um, there we go, all right, so. And this is gonna be nice and pointy and nice and uh, condensed. So having. Uh, having, huh, maybe I want to put fresh over here, and then strawberries. Yeah, I think I'll do that. Having fresh Straw berries, so straw hyphen berries. Fresh.
on, on my, on my. No, on, on, let's see. So I got, on, on. kind of blocked myself here. You know what? <clears throat> I'm going to just do on my okay. and breakfast cereal. And actually, let's do that. Breakfast cereal. I put the. I'm going to put cereal right down at the bottom here. Okay. <laughs> I mean, you know, you do it, you try it out. It's kind of an interesting pattern. It's not perfect, but uh, there we are. All right. Um, so, so those are two of my additions to um, the uh, things that Anna put into the thing. Very. Uh, and so, I'm going to turn this off now. All right. Stop recording. <laughs> Christopher, how are you? I'm good. Well, good. we're at the end of this project. Yeah. And uh, we thought we'd reflect a little bit about what it was like. Mm -hmm. um, how'd you feel about what we what we just did? I really enjoyed it. Um, I was a little self-conscious writing while I was filming myself because I didn't feel like I had the freedom to think about the composition as I normally do when we're just sitting at the holiday fair for four hours and talking and chatting with people who come along and taking our time. Yeah. But uh, so it was interesting. I was actually glad that you mentioned that because when you filmed yourself writing, you did it before I did mm -hmm. and you mentioned this. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so when I decided to film myself writing, I actually sat before I hit record, I sat for a long time and actually made a plan. Mm -hmm. And so even though I talk in the video as though uh -huh. I'm making it up as I go along, yeah. I actually had a pretty firm idea what I was gonna do. Mm -hmm. Um, you sneaky devil. Well, I mean, it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's live and learn. And yeah. uh, this is such yeah. a different medium. It, um, yeah. yeah. So, uh, so there is a kind of time pressure when you know, mm -hmm. oh, you've hit record. So boom, 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 let's go. And you can pause it, I guess. But that yeah. means you're always going to go over and be fiddling with the screen, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah. 
Maybe. I was impressed that you could write and talk simultaneously. I don't seem to be able to do that. I yeah, I don't anyway. know. I, yeah, that's funny, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I was afraid I'd misspell something. Uh huh. But luckily, yeah. I didn't. Yeah, yeah. I also enjoyed the fact that we had to um, be flexible. That you know, we didn't quite do it the way we expected to. We didn't film ourselves doing everything. Yeah. And. Uh, we did some personal things that, you know, we just left solo, you know, so, so it was interesting. It was, yeah. 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 And I thought working with the words that they gave us um, was really nice. Yeah. It was, it was uh, and it was kind of nice sometimes just to do solo ones where it's just, this is about the words and these right. are the things people learned by being uh -huh. in that lockdown. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And let that be the hero. Yeah. Yeah, I, I I enjoyed it as much as as much as our usual collaborations, even though it was so different. Well, and you know what's funny is I it was a real collaboration, mm -hmm. and I was afraid that through this, since we're in two locations and we're talking over screens and mm -hmm. on the phone, and um, that it wouldn't have that sort of quality. Yeah, actually, it did. It did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah so. I guess it'll be fun to see if we can make some sort of printed piece out of it that we could bring to the next <clears throat> fair to auction off as we right. have do done in the past. So that's right. I yeah. guess people will just have to wait and see how it turns out. Well, that's right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, I also, I mean, I have to say it pushed some of my digital skills mm -hmm. uh, well beyond where I was before, hmm. which is fun. I mean, yeah. I, I haven't done that much motion work or uh -huh. making gifts and stuff like that. Mm. Um, but I just did this exercise with my students at Pratt. And mm -hmm. uh, so I was kind of up to speed a little bit better. Mm. Um, and I used some functions in Photoshop that I hadn't used. Mm. Uh, but, but I do, oh man, I feel um, with print, I know exactly what resolution, mm -hmm. how it prints, and, and I'm just a little bit like, mm, throw it out in the world, I hope it works. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay, so I guess with, we'll find out. <laughs> we, will, we will find out. We've had some nice backup, backup from the society. Yes, oh, we've, <laughs> this wouldn't be happening without our tech team. Right. So thank you all, uh, Juan, Juan, Adrian, Chevelli, and I suspect there are other people out there who yeah. helped us. Yeah. So um, thanks for helping us absolutely. do this. Yeah. So. Another thing about doing this in the digital realm is um, uh, that did affect the kind of uh, way I wrote. So it affected, I was, I was a lot less conscious of being stuck with a particular size paper or a particular mm. area I had to write in. Mm. I just wrote on the paper and I thought about it a little bit, how it sat on the page, but I always knew that I was going to scan it. Hmm. I always knew I could shift it, move it. Um, and in the final uh, little video that I did with all of our writing, mm -hmm. I definitely tweaked it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. But the other thing is things had to be bold. Yeah. I knew yeah. they were going to be scanned and I didn't mm -hmm. know what size they were going to be. Yeah. So, so that I didn't do some of the lighter writing that I was uh -huh. in person. Yeah. And I can never resist doing that stuff. So. I have to learn too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but we only had one thing, um, the um, the steam dot. The steam, yeah, yeah. On yeah. one of the things. Um, that's the only one yeah. you had to redo because it didn't Right, out. yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's not so bad. <laughs> that's not so bad. <laughs> okay, well. Well. Thank you everybody for coming and watching us. And That's right. I hope it's been a, a digital center for our audience. Yes. <laughs> just as it has been for us. For us, right. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Christopher. Thank you. Bye, everybody. everybody. Bye.